This is our first takes follow up to the September 18 fatal crash of November 218 Victor Bravo. If you missed it, you can view it in the video linked above. The NTSB has published their preliminary report of this accident, showing a critical four minute gap in the ADSB data. However, we were able to fill in that gap with sparse but defendable data from a flight aware receiver just south of the airport. Let's bring in Mark Waddell, Dean of Aviation Safety, with the details. Mark? Thanks, Chuck. The NTSB has released a preliminary report concerning the fatal accident that took the lives of Brett James and his two passengers. This report was released on October 16, 2025. The NTSB determined the accident occurred at 2.56 p.m. local time at Macon County Airport near Franklin, North Carolina. The NTSB has listed this accident as a loss of control in flight while flying the final leg of a VFR traffic pattern. Winds were calm and skies were clear. The NTSB's on-site investigation found no pre-accident system failures. The NTSB reviewed the flight plan and the pilot's communications with air traffic control. ADSB coverage near Macon County was impacted by terrain and became sparse as the aircraft descended for landing. Nevertheless, eyewitnesses observed the crash, which was also recorded by airport surveillance video. The pilot had departed Nashville, Tennessee on an instrument flight plan direct to Macon County Airport. Approaching the airport, the pilot requested a visual approach to runway 7. This was fine given the reported weather. However, it required that the pilot provide his own terrain clearance since he was not following a charted instrument approach. The airport sits in a bowl with the instrument approach from the south only getting an IFR aircraft down to about 3,600 feet or roughly 1,600 feet above the airport elevation, five miles south of the airport. This pilot was arriving from the west for uh, an intended landing on runway 7. There's a mountain ridge just to the west of the airport that can be unnerving for approaches from this direction. The higher terrain would have also obstructed a direct approach to runway 7. After the pilot reported he had the airport in sight, the controller authorized the pilot to change his radio to the common traffic advisory frequency at Macon County Airport. The pilot broadcast his position at 6,800 feet and his intention to fly a descending 360-degree turn to land on runway 7. This is significant because the pilot was planning to fly a straight-in final approach to runway 7 rather than enter the standard airport traffic pattern. The controller reminded the pilot that he had not switched over to the airport frequency. No further transmissions were received from the pilot. This reconstruction shows the high terrain west of the airport. We can see the pilot began his turn at about 6,300 feet. His intention again was to descend in the turn until he was set up at the correct altitude for straight in to runway 7. As he comes around the first quarter turn, he's beginning to line up with the runway, uh, but he's still quite high. He continued this turn for another full 360 degrees to lose more altitude. As he completed this turn, the aircraft was lining up on the extended runway center line. However, the approach was very high, fast, and steep. The pilot had options here. Break off the approach to runway 7 and either go around or perhaps a better alternative may have been to maneuver to his left, descend, and re-enter the traffic pattern on a right downwind to land on runway 25 in the opposite direction. According to the NTSB report, the aircraft was recorded by ADSB on a half-mile final to runway 7 at a little over 1,200 feet above runway elevation. 
the aircraft was too high to complete a stable approach to land. This position was recorded about four minutes prior to the accident. The crash site was located a quarter mile east of the airport. The airplane came to rest upright. All major components were found at the crash site. The flight control surfaces were all located and flight control continuity was traced throughout the flight control system. The engine and propeller components were examined. Crankshaft and camshaft continuity was confirmed and bore scope examination was performed on the cylinders. All showed signs of normal combustion. Surveillance video showed the aircraft had been flying low over the runway before initiating a descending left turn. The video continued to show the airplane in a descending left turn before entering a tightening spiral and impacting the ground. Witnesses described the aircraft rocking from side to side. They also observed the wingtips moving up and down before the aircraft appeared to roll inverted and disappear behind a tree line. Witnesses also reported the aircraft had flown at low altitude near the airport and over a nearby school playground prior to the accident. The NTSB preliminary report does not explain the time sequence of these witness observations. The fixed-based operator, Macon Air, maintains two surveillance cameras at the airport. Video of the crash has not been released to the public. The west camera, as shown here, has a clear view of approaches to runway 7. There's also an east camera that had a clear view of the accident site. The elementary school is in the background. Eyewitnesses at this school playground also observed the crash. Sparse ADSB data made it difficult to trace the flight path leading up to the crash. Surveillance video and witness accounts, however, supported a preliminary assessment that the pilot lost control during a visual flight rules final approach. Data recovered from the aircraft may help investigators better understand what preceded the loss of control. The NTSB's flight track analysis ends with the aircraft on short final for runway 7 at about 4 minutes before the crash occurred. Witness accounts and surveillance video only captured the final moments of the crash. There is a 4 minute gap between the last recorded ADSB position reported by the NTSB and the reported accident time. Investigators need to examine data that might be recovered from the aircraft avionics and its recoverable data module. This data should provide a clearer picture of the factors that may have contributed to the pilot's loss of control. We reviewed several sources of publicly available ADSB data. ADSB Exchange and FlightAware both tracked the aircraft to approximately the same position reported by the NTSB on short final for runway 7 four minutes prior to the accident. But significantly, both also tracked the aircraft flying past the runway. FlightAware also tracked the aircraft appearing to enter a left-hand pattern for a second landing attempt. The sequence was not described in the NTSB preliminary report. FlightAware position reports came from a receiver located in Tocoa, Georgia, 38 miles south of Macon County Airport. Two position reports bookend the last position that was reported by the NTSB. The approach here was high, fast, and steep. There were four more position reports with up to 20 second gaps. These recorded the aircraft flying down the runway and turning to enter a left-hand traffic pattern to return for a second landing attempt. The ground track appears to cross near the school playground where, according to the NTSB, eyewitnesses have reported observing the aircraft. Three more position reports placed the aircraft approximately in a left turn onto a tight left base leg for runway 7. 
the last five position reports from FlightAware approximate a second landing approach and the ensuing crash. The peak sink rate recorded by FlightAware was 1,375 feet per minute, which doesn't meet stable approach criteria. The speed on final began at 130 knots, which likewise does not meet stable approach criteria. It bled off rapidly during the approach. Approaching the threshold, the aircraft was still about 250 feet above the runway. It had slowed to 103 knots here, and the sink rate was 844 feet per minute. The final two records from FlightAware show the aircraft position exiting the left side of the runway with ground speed continuing to bleed off. The slowest ground speed recorded by FlightAware was 72 knots. The track ends near the crash site at 2.56 p.m., which is the same accident time reported by the NTSB. The flight track obtained from FlightAware shows a tight left-hand pattern for a second landing attempt on runway 7. A one-mile wide traffic pattern is shown here for reference. However, the traffic pattern altitude at Macon County is non-standard. In fact, it appears this pilot climbed nearly 500 feet above the traffic pattern altitude before commencing his turn to final for the second landing attempt. We found a previous flight in August 2024 landing at Macon County. In that instance, the pilot had entered a right downwind for runway 25, and it appeared to land uneventfully. However, most of his prior flights appeared to be either instrument approaches or vectors to final that did not involve flying standard traffic patterns at standard airspeeds. We also did not find evidence of recent training in conducting go-arounds from unstable approaches. These are perishable skills that pilots need to refresh through regular recurrent training. We express our deepest condolences to all family, friends, and colleagues of the pilot and his passengers. Thanks, Mark. There was no evidence of engine or airframe malfunctions. There is a four minute gap in the NTSB preliminary report. They may be waiting to fill in this gap with data from the recoverable data module. However, we were able to fill in that gap with sparse but defendable data from a flight aware receiver just south of the airport. The data is consistent with eight Victor Bravo overflying the airport after the first landing attempt, entering a high tight left pattern for a second landing attempt on runway seven. This approach was also high and fast, but passing over the runway threshold, the data supports rapid slowing. Did the pilot reduce power to idle to slow down? The data goes on to show the airplane veering left of center line, continuing to slow, entering a left turn. Was the pilot executing a go around? For unknown reasons, in those last moments, the pilot lost control. Witness and surveillance video support a loss of control due to exceeding the wing's critical angle of attack, causing it to stall at an altitude from which recovery was not possible. Our data aligns with the NTSB data on the time of the crash. The country music world will miss Brett James. It's in the hands of the NTSB now. If you're interested in joining the Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association, Learning more about Cirrus's free Embark training for pilots of pre-owned Cirrus and Cirrus Direct Training, we have put links in the description below. I hope to see you on the forums, or better yet, at the next CPPP. I'm Chuck Calley, and this has been First Takes.